Good morning. So, today we are going to look at archetypal criticism. What is the etymology of this word and what does it mean? Uh, so, let me begin by explaining the root of this word. So, the etymological uh, root of this word is arch and typo. Arch is the beginning and typo means imprint. We will discuss these things later. Um, in other words, archetypal or archetype rather is a constantly recurring motif, symbol and theme. In literature, uh, a kind of pattern form which uh, um, uh, other similar things can develop. Now, archetypes often appear in various cultural traditions and myths and we are going to look at that. But first, let us get introduced to the key names and some key uh, figures and uh, books related to archetypal criticism. So, Carl Jung. 1875 to 1961, Maud Botkin who wrote archetypal patterns in poetry in 1934 and Northrop Frye 1912 to 91 who wrote anatomy of criticism in 1957. So, these are the key names and key books in archetypal criticism. As already mentioned that archetypes often appear in various cultural traditions and myths, archetypal critics account for a universality in literature by pointing to recurring patterns and images that appear so deeply embedded in the human mind and culture that they strike a responsive chord in everyone. Like structuralist criticism, archetypal criticism proceeds from the initial assumption that every work of literature can be categorized and fitted into a large framework that encompasses all literature. So, these are the key terms that you should know. What are we talking about? Uh, categories in literature that every uh, text, every work of literature and I, we can even extend it to films, every, every text can be categorized and fitted into a larger framework that encompasses all uh, works of literature or cinema. In other words, all texts. So, therefore, key concepts here would be recurring motifs, uh, the collective unconscious which is related to Carl Jung's theories, we will talk about it and also the theory of individuation. Um, so, archetypal criticism has its roots in anthropological and psychological studies. Uh, it owes much as I have already uh, told you at the beginning, it owes much uh, to the works of Carl Jung and uh, it emerged uh, the key discussion or the seminal discussion of this criticism is started in the 30s and focuses on those patterns in a literary work that commonly occur in other literary works. In other words, what are we talking about? Uh, discussion of motives and recurring motives especially. Uh, this is another term that is mythic criticism. Now, some important mythic and archetypal criticism was done in the early 20th century. Uh, however, the great flowering of mythic criticism was in the 50s and the 60s. So, it all began in the earlier parts, so let us say the 30s and the 40s, but it reached its peak during the 50s and the 60s. Since then, the prestige of mythic and archetypal approaches uh, still have great popular appeal and continue to exercise fascination over each new generation of students exposed to them. So, this is something very popular and very common in literary criticism. Uh, uh, well, the uh, explanation is quite simple because uh, this is something that occurs in every culture. Irrespective of any nation or any culture, there are certain archetypes which can be figured out and, we, and can be categorized easily. So, 
perhaps that accounts for the popularity of archetypal criticism. Now, uh, Carl Jung 1875 to 1961, um, according to him, these patterns are embedded deep in the collective unconscious. So, this is the term we are talking about now, the collective unconscious and involve racial memories of situations, events and relationships from time immemorial. Young suggests that the archetypal patterns will help clarify the individual text by connecting it to more universal patterns than uh, that often transcend beyond literature itself. So, what is the keyword now? The universality. So, you can look at another feat term, universality or universal patterns okay, that can be extended uh, beyond literature across cultures and nations. Young posited that humanity has a collective unconscious that manifests itself in dreams, myths and literature through archetypes. Uh, persistent images, figures and story patterns shared by people across diverse cultures. So, there are a set of patterns and images and themes and myths uh, that are shared among people irrespective of their cultures, is irrespective of their countries okay? and therefore, the popularity and therefore, the enormous interest that still persists in this theory, in this kind of literary theory. Now, archetypal critics search for archetypal patterns and literary works. So, what are those archetypal patterns? Let me give it to you. These are character types. These are plot devices on plot types, settings and symbols. Character types, plots, setting and symbols. So, this is what the archetypal critics look for. Uh, Maud Botkin we have all, I have already mentioned who wrote archetypal patterns in poetry, he made a major contribution to the study of archetypal images in literature. Another key name is Northrop Frye, Anatomy of Criticism um, and he views literature as an autonomous language and words as signs that contribute to the organizing structural pattern or conceptualized myth of which the work is one. Example, uh, Fry was influenced by Freud and the Freudian theory of the unconscious. Archetypes are the clues to finding wholeness. In order to understand something as a whole, it is important to understand the clues and these are the clues that characters, plots, settings, symbols, etc that give us uh, clues to find a kind of pattern, a whole pattern. Uh, if an image, character, uh, character trait, color or symbol appears uh, seem familiar and can be connected to other literature, probably it is an archetype. An archetype is not an archetype unless um, we, we have proved that it recurs throughout literary history. So, there has to be um, a constant uh, recurring pattern and not just uh, a kind of one off occurrence. In any story, the reader recognizes the protagonist and the antagonist and follows them thoroughly um, or th uh, throughout the story cont contributing their characteristic with other throughout the book. Christopher De Quincey.
a philosopher, a theorist. Um, he states archetypes of our ancestral psychic patterns shared across cultures as countless forms buried deep in our collective conscious, unconscious. Um, Quin the Quincy refers to Jung's collective unconscious and explains the patterns in seven parts and what are these seven parts? He talks about warrior, poet, artist, scientist, philosopher, shaman and mystic criticism of meaning. So, these are the seven parts. Archetypal criticism assumes that there is a collection of symbols, images, characters and motifs that suggest basically the same response in all people. Take for example, the color red or even the color green. Now, what are the associations? Generally, in most cultures, in most societies, red signifies violent passion disorder, uh, blood and sacrifice. In one of our earlier courses, uh, we talked about the color theory um, in the introduction to film studies course and where we talked about um, the saturated color scheme in American beauty and taxi driver. So, perhaps that should help uh, you understand that uh, the associations of the color red. So, sacrifice, passion, um, deep emotions and sometimes even disorder. And on the other hand, green signifies growth, certain kinds of sensations, hopes, fertility and um, as we have seen in the movie uh, uh, Natural Born Killers, green uh, is also um, associated with poison, death and decay. So, this is something which is very common in all societies. Um, we also have connotations of blue, the color blue, uh, it which is uh, the color is generally assumed or understood as a highly positive associated with truth, religious feelings, society, uh, security and even spi spiritual purity. A color like black in most cultures stands for chaos, mystery, the unknown, even death, funeral. Um, sometimes evil and melancholy as well. On the other hand, white in most cultures signifies purity, spirituality, innocence, timelessness. In certain cultures, in its negative aspects, it can also mean death, terror, the supernatural, etc. Talking about the various motives now um, and the character motives. So, we have character figure of the father, the father figure. Now, father in most cultures uh, stand for, uh, the father figure stands for authority, uh, discipline and power. Think of a movie such as How to Train Your Dragon. The mother figure on the other hand is nurturing and comforting. The child between the, mother, the father and the mother, you have the child and um, the figure, the motive figure is uh, the child stands for innocence, salvation. Okay. There may be a certain um, literary text, for example, uh, the, uh, the book Omen and uh, subsequently there was a film based on it where uh, this is challenged, but don't you know that is the beauty, um, that is the pleasure of watching uh, a film like that, where the motives are challenged and um, interrogated something goes against the type. You have the character motives of the hero who is generally regarded in all cultures as the champion or defender, think, uh, think uh, the Terminator series or the Die Hard series. So, hero as a defender, as a rescuer, um, he has an independent identity of his own. We also have the motive of the wise old man and think of the Lord of the Rings. Okay, the hobbit figure. So, he is the old man who gives guidance and he is the font of knowledge and wisdom. We also have the trickster character who is a deceiver uh, and a troublemaker. 
Okay, and this is a character that is very popular and very common in most works of uh, literature. Let us talk about Jung now. So, Carl Gustav Jung um, was a student of Sigmund Freud. He addresses the relevance of archetypal theory in literature and the arts most clearly in The Spirit in Man, Art and Literature in 1966 which contains two significant essays on literature and poetry. Uh, it was uh, first published in 1922 and then 1930. The basic uh, tenets of Jung's uh, writings are that he first gave prominence to the term archetype. He became convinced that all humans share a collective unconscious, uh, an unconscious which does not derive from personal experience and is not a personal acquisition, but is inborn. In Jung's archetypal theory, the unconscious mind plays a profound role and it has a purpose which is to assist individuals in maintaining a balanced psychological state. So, archetypes are the contents of the collective unconscious defined as primordial or universal images that have existed since the remotest times. These are formed during the earliest stages of human development. Although the theory may seem almost mystic, Jung found no other way to account for the appearance of nearly um, identical images and patterns in the minds of individuals from wholly different set of cultures and backgrounds. So, this uh, the notion of consistency across cultures that is what fascinated Jung and that is how he uh, gave, he conceptualized his theories. <coughs> Jung notes instances this suggest that water is a symbol of the unconscious and the action of descending to the water is a symbol of the frightening experience of confronting the depths of one's unconscious. Jung's account of a patient who in 1960s related visions containing odd symbolic configurations, uh, later uh, uh, he encountered similar symbols in a Greek papyrus first de deciphered in 1910. Theory of individuation now. It is a psychological growing up, it is a process of learning of one's own individuality, it is a process of self recognition which is essential to becoming a well balanced person. For Jung, neuroses are result of person's failure to confront and accept archetypal components of the unconscious and the inherited components of the psyche. The sum of the principles are archetypes, animus, anima and shadows. Animus stands for the physical man, represents a physical brutish strength of man and his animal instincts. It can be the masculine designation of the female psyche. Anima is the soul image, is the spiritual life force, the living thing in man that which lives of itself and causes life, the archetypes of life itself. Feminine designation, it is the feminine designation in the male psyche and is it a, and it is associated with feelings, passions, instinctive unconscious aspects of the psyche. So, these are th these are the major differences between animus and anima and let us talk about shadows now. The shadow stands for the darker side of our unconscious self that needs to be suppressed. Uh, it is inferior less pleasing aspect of the personality and represent the dangerous aspect of the unrecognized dark half of the personality. So, when projected 
shadow becomes the villain and the devil. The theory of archetypes would explain not only such instances as these, but also the similarity of myths and rituals uh, found by uh, people such as James Fraser. For archetypes of universal patterns from which myths derive. From Young, let us move on to Northrop Frye, 1912 to 1991. He was a Canadian literary critic best known as a major exponent of archetypal criticism. His seminal book is Anatomy of Criticism, Four Essays in 1957, where he, re says that, uh, where he relies solely upon literature to draw the archetypal patterns. In Anatomy of Criticism, Fra, uh, Northrop Frye introduced archetypal criticism, identifying and discussing basic archetypal patterns as found in myths, literary genres, and the reader's imagination. Archetype for him is a symbol, usually an image, which recurs often enough in literature to be recognized as an element of one's literary experience as a whole. In literature, characters, images and themes that symbolically embody universal meanings and basic human experiences, regardless of when or where they live, are considered archetypes. Common literary archetypes include stories of quest. Uh, I am sure some of you are familiar with uh, uh, a book by Joseph Campbell, uh, Heroes with a Thousand Faces. So, uh, there are certain stages, certain archetypes that Campbell explores and uh, um, he talks majorly about the theme of exploration and journey and quest. Okay, so, there is a quest, there is there are initiations and then descents to the underworld and ascents to heaven. So, that is the journey of a hero and that is something that Northrop Frye is also interested in. So, this is a symbol which recurs often enough in literature to be recognizable as an element of one's experience, uh, which experience devices and elaborate classification of modes, symbols, myths and Johns. Archetype establishes a comprehensive correspondence between the basic genres that, that genres as we all know they are comedy, tragedy, um, romance, etcetera. So, there is another concept called mythos, which is like unifying myth. So, myths and archetypal patterns are associated with seasonal cycle of spring, summer, fall and winter. So, four cycles of season and myths and archetypal patterns are associated with them. Now, mythos which means a unifying myth um, is analogous to seasons of year to the story of uh, birth, death and rebirth of the mythic hero. For instance, mythos of summer, it is analogous to the birth and youthful adventures of the mythic hero and suggests innocence and triumph, narrative of wish, fulfillment, wish fulfillment with good characters triumphing over bad, the, the, the conflict between the good and the evil and the ultimate triumph of the good over evil. For example, uh, the legend uh, of uh, Robin Hood and even old fashioned cowboy movies. Okay. So, they derive from this mythos. Mythos of autumn, autumn as a season, um, which uh, symbolizes tragedy, major movement towards uh, the death or defeat of the hero. For example, um, as shown in Oedipus and Shakespeare's King Lear. Mythos of winter, so this is irony or satire, where uh, the hero becomes absent. 
society is now left with, uh, with without any effective leadership or sense of values. For example, uh, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, uh, where social norms are turned upside down for artistic purposes and also think of uh, um, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, where, which uh, is uh, permeated with, sense of, with a sense of hopelessness and bondage. Mythos of Spring, so from um, summer, winter and autumn we come to spring and spring suggests comedy, rebirth of hero, in other words um, happy ending, renewal of life in which those elements of society who would uh, block the heroes are overcome. The hero and heroine take their rightful place and order is restored, particularly think of uh, the, all the great Shakespearean comedies. So, every work of literature has its place within the scheme of myth, every piece of literature adds to the scheme of the myth. Coming to strengths of archetypal criticism, now uh, this allows us to see the larger patterns of literature. Uh, it involves studies of anthropology, psychology and cultural history and all these have broadened through um, uh, the usage, you know, these studies have been broadened through the usage of archetypal criticism. So, it has had a far reaching influence on other domains and other fields of academics as well. The weaknesses could be that it tends to ignore the individual contributions of the author and the specific cultural and societal influences. Um, some are even uh, skeptical of this approach since it appears to lean towards the occult, but then that is a different area altogether. There is also much confusion over the definitions of the objects in the actual myths and the fact that people uh, could be or sometimes they are actually more interested in concrete ideas and not on um, motives and patterns and, the and symbols. So, basic premises of archetypal theory, the critic is at the center of interpretative activity and the critic functions as a teacher or a prophet or a seer. Criticism is a structure of thought and knowledge in its own right. The critic works in inductively by reading individual works and letting critical principles shape themselves out of the literature that is the critic examines the individual work to ascertain the archetypes underlying the work. Uh, one thing that we must remember is that in archetypal criticism, literary taste is not relevant to literary criticism. Ethical criticism is important, that is the critic must be aware of art as a form of communication from the past to the present. All literary works are considered part of tradition in this uh, approach. And like mathematics, literature is a language that can provide the means for expressing truths. Verbal constructs of, uh, that is the works of literature represent mythical outlines of universal truths. To conclude, the aim of archetypal approach is to find out how we can look in a work for this kind of structures and these universal symbols which allow us to describe our work as classic universal because they can produce a similar human response not only at the same time, but also at different times and at different places of the history. Archetypal criticism has several points in common with psychological criticism, but while psychological criticism researches the personality of each individual and uh, considers the literary work as a product of neurosis, this is not the case in archetypal criticism. And here are a few links to some important websites uh, and references. Thank you very much and we will continue with other approaches and other theories in our next session.